I came home from work on a rainy evening. My house was quiet, just like always. I kicked off my wet shoes and hung up my coat. I was tired and looking forward to a relaxing evening. As I walked into the kitchen, I saw a note on the table. It was just a plain piece of paper, but what was written on it made my stomach drop. I know your secret. I stared at the note, trying to make sense of it. Who could have left it? What secret? My mind was racing. I lived alone and I didn't have any big secrets, at least none that I could think of. I decided to search the house. I checked every room, every closet, even under the beds. Everything was in its place. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. That night, I couldn't stop thinking about the note. I tried to watch TV to distract myself, but my mind kept going back to those words. When it got late, I went to bed, hoping I could sleep it off. But I kept tossing and turning. Around midnight, I started hearing whispers. At first, I thought it was the wind or maybe the house settling. But the whispers continued, and they seemed to be coming from the attic. I had never spent much time in the attic. It was just a storage space for old stuff I didn't need anymore. I grabbed a flashlight and climbed the stairs. The whispers got louder as I reached the attic door. My heart was beating fast, and I hesitated for a moment before opening the door. The attic was dark and dusty. I swept the flashlight beam across the room, but I couldn't see anyone. The whispers had stopped. I took a deep breath and stepped inside. I walked around, checking the corners and behind boxes. Then I noticed something strange. There was a small wooden box tucked away in a corner. It didn't look like it belonged there. I opened the box and found a bunch of small cameras and a journal. The cameras were the kind you could hide easily, like in a bookcase or behind a picture frame. I felt a chill as I realized someone had been watching me. I opened the journal, and my blood ran cold. It was full of notes about my daily life, things I did, places I went, even what I ate for breakfast. But the handwriting was what shocked me the most. It was my own handwriting. I couldn't believe it. I sat down on an old chair, trying to make sense of it all. Had I written these notes? I didn't remember doing it. I flipped through the pages, and the more I read, the more confused I became. The journal detailed things I had done over the past few months, things I had no memory of writing down. Suddenly, a memory flashed in my mind. A few months ago, I had a car accident. It wasn't serious, but I hit my head pretty hard. The doctor said I might experience some memory loss or confusion for a while, but I had felt fine after a few days. Could this be related to that? I didn't know what to do. Should I call the police? Tell a friend? I felt like I was losing my mind. I decided to take the journal and the cameras downstairs. Maybe I could figure it out in the morning. As I was leaving the attic, I heard a soft click behind me. I turned around and saw the attic door slowly closing on its own. I rushed out and closed it behind me, my hands trembling. I went back to my bedroom and locked the door. I put the journal and cameras on my nightstand and tried to calm down. I told myself I would deal with it in the morning. The next day, I woke up early. I felt a little better with the daylight streaming through the windows. I picked up the journal and started reading it again. As I read, something caught my eye. There was a note scribbled on the last page. Check the basement. My heart sank. I didn't want to go to the basement. It was dark and creepy, and I rarely went down there but I had to know what was going on. I grabbed the flashlight again and headed to the basement door. The basement was cold and musty. I carefully walked down the stairs, the flashlight beam bouncing off the walls. I reached the bottom and looked around. At first, I didn't see anything unusual. Just the same old boxes and tools. Then I saw it. Another wooden box, just like the one in the attic. I opened it, and found more cameras and another journal. This one was different, though. 
The notes were even more detailed, almost obsessive. There were drawings too. Drawings of me, in different rooms, doing different things. I felt sick. Who was doing this to me? Why? Then I noticed something strange. One of the drawings showed me sitting at the kitchen table, reading a note. The note said, I know your secret. But there was more written below it. It's not over. I backed away from the box, my mind racing. I needed help. I grabbed my phone and called my friend Mark. He answered on the second ring. Hey, it's me. I need your help. Can you come over? Sure, what's going on? He asked, sounding concerned. I'll explain when you get here. Just hurry. Mark arrived about 15 minutes later. I showed him the journal and the cameras. He was just as shocked as I was. This is crazy. He said. We need to call the police. We decided to call the police and show them everything. While we waited for them to arrive, we sat in the living room, trying to make sense of it all. Suddenly, Mark looked at me with a strange expression. Are you sure you didn't write these? He asked. Of course I'm sure, I said, feeling defensive. Why would I do something like this? He didn't say anything, but I could tell he was thinking hard. The police arrived shortly after and took everything as evidence. They promised to investigate and let me know if they found anything. For the next few days, I stayed with Mark. I didn't want to be alone in the house. The police called me a few times with updates, but they hadn't found anything yet. Then, one evening, I got a call from the detective in charge of my case. We've been reviewing the evidence, he said, and we found something you should know about. What is it? I asked, feeling nervous. One of the cameras had footage of you setting up the other cameras. I felt like the ground was falling out from under me. That can't be right. I don't remember doing that. We think it might be related to your accident. He said gently. You might have been experiencing some kind of dissociative state. I didn't know what to say. It was like my whole world had been turned upside down. I thanked the detective and hung up. Mark was sitting across from me, looking worried. What did they say? He asked. I told him everything. He listened quietly, then nodded. Maybe you should see a doctor, someone who can help you figure this out. I agreed. The next few weeks were a blur of doctor's appointments and therapy sessions. Slowly, I started to piece together what had happened. The accident had caused more damage than I realized. I had been living a double life, doing things I had no memory of. It was a long and difficult process, but eventually, I started to feel like myself again. The whispers stopped, and I no longer felt like I was being watched. The police closed the case, and I moved on with my life. But sometimes, late at night, I still hear whispers, and I wonder if it's really over. I never thought I'd be telling this story. It's one of those things you think happens only in movies or books, but it happened to me. My name is Mike, and last year, I took a job as a night shift janitor at an old hospital called St. Mary's. It was one of those places that had been around forever, you know? The kind of hospital where people say they've seen things. The pay was decent, and I needed the money, so I didn't really care about the stories. The job was pretty straightforward, clean the floors, empty the trash, and make sure everything was locked up at the end of the night. I usually worked alone, and that was fine by me. I liked the quiet. One night, around 2 a.m., I was mopping the floor near the old wing of the hospital. This part of the building had been abandoned for years. They said it was too expensive to fix up, so they just closed it off. As I worked, I heard a faint crying sound. At first, I thought I was just hearing things, but the sound got louder. It was coming from the abandoned wing. Curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to check it out. I mean, it was probably just some pipes or the wind, right? 
As I got closer, the crying turned into soft sobs. I pushed open the heavy door to the old wing and walked down the dimly lit hallway. The place smelled musty, like it hadn't been touched in years. At the end of the hall I saw her. A little girl, maybe seven or eight years old, sitting on the floor in a hospital gown. She looked so out of place, like she didn't belong there. Her hair was long and dark, and her eyes were red from crying. Hey there, I said softly trying not to scare her. Are you okay? She looked up at me with big, sad eyes. I'm lost, she said. I can't find my parents. I felt a pang of sympathy for her. Don't worry, we'll find them, I said. What's your name? She replied. Emily. Okay, Emily. Let's go to the main office and see if we can find any information about your parents, all right? She nodded and stood up, taking my hand. As we walked back through the abandoned wing, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. Why was she here? How did she get into this part of the hospital? But I pushed those thoughts aside. The important thing was to help her. When we got to the main office, I started looking through the old patient records. Emily stood quietly beside me, watching as I flipped through the pages. I couldn't find anything about her. There was no record of an Emily being admitted to the hospital recently. Are you sure your name is Emily? I asked, puzzled. She nodded again. Yes, that's my name. Just then, one of the older nurses, Mrs. Thompson, walked in. She had been working at St. Mary's for over 30 years and knew everything about the place. Mike, what are you doing? She asked, looking at me and then at Emily. I found her in the old wing. I explained. She says she's lost and can't find her parents. Mrs. Thompson's face went pale. Emily, you said? Yeah, why? She swallowed hard and then looked at Emily with wide eyes. Mike, that's impossible. Emily was a patient here over 30 years ago. She died in a car accident on her way to the hospital. Her parents were with her. I felt a cold chill run through me. But she's right here, I said, looking at Emily. Mrs. Thompson shook her head. There's no record of her because they removed all the files after the accident. It was a big scandal back then. I looked down at Emily, who was still holding my hand. She looked up at me with sad eyes and whispered, I just want to find my parents. I didn't know what to do. My mind was racing. This girl in front of me looked exactly like the old photo Mrs. Thompson showed me. It couldn't be a coincidence. We need to help her, I said finally. Mrs. Thompson nodded slowly. All right, let's go to the old records room. Maybe we can find something there. We made our way to the dusty old records room. It was filled with boxes and files untouched for years. Mrs. Thompson and I started searching through the boxes. And after a while, we found a file labeled, Emily Carter. I opened it up and found an old photo of a little girl who looked just like Emily. There were also pictures of her parents and a newspaper clipping about the accident. It was all true. Emily looked at the photos and tears welled up in her eyes. That's them, she said softly. Those are my parents. Mrs. Thompson and I exchanged a look. We didn't know how it was possible, but it was clear that Emily was telling the truth. We decided to take her to the spot where the accident happened, just outside the hospital. Maybe it would give her some peace. As we stood there, Emily let go of my hand and walked towards the spot. She turned back to us and smiled. Thank you, she said. And then, just like that, she was gone. Mrs. Thompson and I stood there in shock. We didn't know what had just happened, but we felt like we had helped her in some way. I never saw Emily again after that night, but I like to think that she finally found her parents and the peace she was looking for. Working at St. Mary's was never the same after that. I still hear stories from other staff about strange things happening, but I always keep that night in mind. Sometimes, the past isn't really gone. Sometimes, it's just waiting for someone to help set it free. 
After Emily disappeared, Mrs. Thompson and I stood there in stunned silence, trying to make sense of what had just happened. The air around us felt heavy, and the night seemed darker than usual. We decided to head back inside, hoping to leave the eerie feeling behind us. The next night, I returned to my shift with a sense of unease. I couldn't stop thinking about Emily and how she had vanished. As I went about my duties, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Every creak and groan of the old hospital seemed louder, and the shadows seemed to stretch and move in ways they shouldn't. Around midnight, I heard the crying again. It was coming from the same abandoned wing. My heart sank, but I knew I had to check it out. I grabbed my flashlight and made my way down the dimly lit hallway. The crying grew louder as I approached the spot where I had found Emily the previous night. There she was, sitting on the floor in her hospital gown, just like before. Her eyes were wide with fear, and she looked more lost than ever. Emily? I called out, my voice trembling. She looked up at me, tears streaming down her face. I can't find my parents, she repeated, her voice shaky. A sense of dread washed over me. Something was very wrong. Emily, we found out about you last night. You, you disappeared. What happened? She shook her head, looking more terrified by the second. I need to find my parents. Please help me. I felt a knot in my stomach. This wasn't right. Something was keeping her here, and I had a terrible feeling it wasn't something good. I knew I had to try to help her, but I didn't know how. Just then, the lights flickered, and the air grew colder. I felt a presence behind me, and when I turned around, I saw a figure standing in the shadows. It was a man, tall and thin, with hollow eyes and a sinister grin. His presence filled me with a sense of dread I had never felt before. Who are you? I demanded, trying to keep my voice steady. The man stepped forward, his eyes fixed on Emily. She belongs to me he said in a cold, raspy voice. She'll never find her parents. She'll never leave. Emily screamed and backed away, but the man moved closer, his grin widening. I tried to step between them, but it felt like an invisible force was holding me back. No! I shouted. Leave her alone! The man laughed, a chilling sound that echoed through the empty hallway. You can't save her he sneered. And now, you've made a grave mistake by trying. Suddenly, the room seemed to spin, and I felt a sharp pain in my chest. The world around me blurred, and I collapsed to the floor. As I lay there, struggling to breathe, I saw Emily being pulled into the shadows by the sinister figure. Her cries for help grew fainter and fainter until they were gone. The last thing I remember before everything went dark was the man's cold mocking laughter echoing in my ears. When I woke up, I was lying in a hospital bed, surrounded by doctors and nurses. Mrs. Thompson was there too, looking worried. They told me I had been found unconscious in the abandoned wing and that I had suffered a heart attack. They couldn't explain how I had survived, but I knew deep down that something had kept me alive. My name is Jack and I live in a quiet suburban neighborhood. It's a nice place with friendly people and well-cut lawns. Everyone knows each other, and we often have block parties and barbecues. But lately, things have been strange. People are disappearing, and no one knows why. It started with Mr. and Mrs. Thompson from across the street. One day, they were there, and the next, they were gone. I didn't think much of it at first. Maybe they went on a trip. But days turned into weeks, and their house stayed empty. I asked around, but no one had seen them leave. Their house looked spotless, like no one ever lived there. Then it happened to the Millers. They were a young couple with a baby. I saw them almost every day, but one morning they just vanished. No moving truck, no goodbye. Just gone. Their house was the same, clean and empty. 
more people started disappearing. The Johnsons, the Ramirez family, even old Mrs. Parker. Each time, their houses were left in perfect condition, no sign of struggle or anything out of place. It was like they never existed. The neighborhood was getting quieter and quieter. At night, I started hearing strange noises from the empty houses. It was like a faint humming or buzzing. Sometimes it sounded like someone was moving furniture. I was curious, but also scared. I didn't want to disappear like the others. One night, I was sitting in my living room, trying to ignore the noises. It was around midnight when I heard it. A low, steady hum coming from my own basement. I froze. My heart was racing, and I didn't know what to do. Should I go check? Or should I just leave and never come back? I grabbed a flashlight and slowly made my way to the basement door. I opened it and stood at the top of the stairs, shining the light down. The hum was louder now. I took a deep breath and started down the stairs. The basement was dark and cold. I could see my breath in the air. As I reached the bottom, the hum stopped. It was dead silent. I swept the flashlight around the room. Everything looked normal. Just boxes and old furniture. But then, in the corner, I saw something strange. There was a small door I had never noticed before. It was hidden behind some shelves. I moved the shelves aside and opened the door. Behind it was a narrow tunnel, barely wide enough to crawl through. The hum started again, louder than ever. I didn't want to go in, but I felt like I had no choice. I had to know what was happening. I crawled through the tunnel, the hum growing louder with each inch. After what felt like forever, I came out into a small room. It was filled with strange machines and monitors. In the center was a large metal table. On it I saw a notebook. I picked it up and started reading. The notebook belonged to Dr. Harold, a scientist who used to live in the neighborhood. He wrote about experiments he was conducting on people. He believed he could make them disappear and reappear in a different dimension. He called it the other side. He had been testing his theory on the neighbors, and it worked. But once they were gone, they couldn't come back. I felt sick to my stomach. Dr. Harold had been kidnapping people and sending them to this other dimension. And now, it seemed like he had set his sights on me. I heard a noise behind me and turned to see Dr. Harold standing there. A twisted smile on his face. You're next, Jack, he said. I tried to run, but he grabbed me and threw me onto the metal table. I struggled, but he was too strong. He strapped me down and started one of the machines. The hum was deafening now. I felt a strange sensation, like I was being pulled apart. Just as I thought it was the end, there was a loud crash. The door burst open, and police officers swarmed in. They grabbed Dr. Harold and shut off the machines. I was free. It turns out, one of the neighbors who hadn't disappeared had grown suspicious and called the police. They had been investigating and finally found the secret basement lab. Dr. Harold was arrested, and the police started looking for a way to bring back the missing neighbors. They found some of Dr. Harold's notes that might help. In the end, our neighborhood started to feel safe again. But I'll never forget the terror of that night and the horrible secret hiding in my own basement. With Dr. Harold in custody, the neighborhood began to heal. The missing neighbors remained a mystery, but there was hope that they could be brought back from wherever they had been sent. As the days passed, life returned to normal. The empty houses were filled again with laughter and light. The Thompsons, the Millers, the Johnsons, the Ramirez family, and even old Mrs. Parker, all returned confused but unharmed. It was like a miracle. The community came together to support each other, grateful to have their loved ones back. We held a big block party to celebrate, with music, food, and laughter filling the streets once more. I sat on my porch, surrounded by friends and neighbors, feeling grateful for the happy ending. We had been through a terrifying ordeal, but we had come out stronger on the other side.
As the sun set and the stars twinkled above, I couldn't help but smile. Our neighborhood may have been through darkness, but now we were bathed in light. And I knew that together, we could overcome anything. With a sense of peace in my heart, I looked forward to the future, knowing that our community was stronger and closer than ever before. And as I watched the children playing and the adults chatting, I knew that no matter what challenges may come our way, we would face them together with courage, strength, and unity. The horrors of the past were behind us, and now we could embrace the joy and love that filled our neighborhood once more. I was driving through this coastal area when the rain started bucketing down. It was one of those nights where you can barely see five feet in front of you. I needed a break from the road, so when I saw a sign for a village nearby, I figured it'd be a good spot to wait out the worst of the storm. The village looked like it had seen better days. The houses were all old and weather-beaten, and there wasn't a single light on in any of them. It was kinda creepy, to be honest, but I didn't have much choice. I parked my car and stepped out into the rain, pulling my jacket tight around me. The streets were deserted, not a soul in sight. I figured everyone was probably hunkered down in their houses, waiting for the storm to pass. As I walked further into the village, I started to notice something weird. The houses all looked abandoned, like no one had lived in them for years. But there were signs of life everywhere clothes hanging on lines, toys scattered in yards, even a pot of stew simmering on a stove in one house. It was like everyone had just up and disappeared in the middle of whatever they were doing. I was starting to get a bad feeling about the place when I stumbled upon an old building that looked like it used to be a church. The doors were hanging off their hinges, and the windows were boarded up, but there was a light flickering inside. Curiosity got the better of me, and I pushed open the door, stepping into the darkness. The light was coming from a single candle sitting on an old wooden table. Next to it was an open diary, its pages yellowed with age. I picked up the diary and started flipping through it, reading about the history of the village. Turns out, it used to be a thriving fishing community, until one day, a terrible storm hit and a whole bunch of people drowned out at sea. The village was never the same after that people started moving away, and those who stayed became reclusive, haunted by the tragedy. But then I came across something that made my blood run cold. It was a description of a ritual a ritual to summon the spirits of the drowned. According to the diary, the villagers believed that if they performed the ritual, they could bring their loved ones back from the dead. I was about to close the diary when I heard a noise behind me. I spun around to see a figure standing in the doorway, silhouetted against the darkness. Who are you? I asked, my voice trembling. The figure didn't answer. Instead, it started walking towards me, its footsteps echoing in the empty room. I backed away, my heart pounding in my chest. But then I realized something even more terrifying there wasn't just one figure, there were several. All standing in the doorways and windows, surrounding me. I turned to run, but they were everywhere, blocking every exit. And as they closed in on me, I knew that I was trapped, at the mercy of whatever evil lurked in this forsaken village. I stumbled backward, my heart racing as the figures closed in on me. Panic seized me as I realized there was no escape. I was trapped in this abandoned church with whatever malevolent force had taken hold of the village. Please, I begged, my voice trembling. Let me go. But the figures remained silent, their ghostly forms advancing steadily toward me. I felt a cold chill run down my spine as they reached out their hands their touch icy against my skin. With nowhere left to run, I closed my eyes and braced myself for whatever horrors awaited me. In that moment of despair, I wished I had never set foot in this cursed village. Suddenly, there was a blinding flash of light, and I felt myself being pulled backward, away from the grasping hands of the spirits. When I opened my eyes, I found myself lying on the wet ground outside the church, the rain still pouring down around me. I scrambled to my feet and ran as fast as I could, not daring to look back. 
As I reached the edge of the village, I glanced over my shoulder one last time, half expecting to see the figures pursuing me. But the village was silent and still, as if nothing had ever happened. I stumbled back to my car, my mind reeling with fear and confusion. As I drove away from that accursed place, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had narrowly escaped something far worse than death. And as I glanced once more in my rearview mirror, I knew that I would never forget the horrors I had witnessed in that remote coastal village. My name is John, and until a few months ago, I thought I was just a regular guy living in an old house. It was a simple, quiet life, the kind most people might find boring. I've lived in this house for about five years. It's been in my family for generations, passed down from my great-grandparents. They built it in the late 1800s, and it's seen a lot over the years. I moved in after my parents decided to retire and moved to Florida. They didn't want to sell the house, so I took it over. It felt like the right thing to do, keeping it in the family and all. Plus, I always liked the idea of living in a house with so much history. At first, everything was fine. I spent my days working from home and my evenings reading or watching TV. It was peaceful. Then, about three months ago, I started waking up at exactly 3 a.m. every night. At first, I thought it was just stress or maybe the noise from the street. But it soon became clear that the sound was coming from inside the house, specifically, from the attic. The footsteps were slow and deliberate, like someone was pacing back and forth. I tried to ignore them, convincing myself it was just the house settling. But as the weeks went by, it got harder to dismiss. The footsteps were too regular, too consistent to be just random noises. The attic was a place I rarely visited. It was mostly filled with old furniture and boxes of stuff my family had collected over the years. It was dusty and cold, and there was no reason for anyone to be up there, especially at 3 a.m. The more I heard the footsteps, the more anxious I became. I started losing sleep, dreading the moment I would wake up to that eerie sound. I even asked a few friends for advice, but they just joked about it being a ghost or my imagination. No one took it seriously, and I started to feel like I was losing my mind. After weeks of sleepless nights and growing anxiety, I knew I had to do something. I couldn't keep living like this, jumping at every sound and feeling like my own home was turning against me. That's when I decided I had to go up to the attic and see for myself what was going on. I chose a moonlit night to finally confront whatever was making those footsteps. Armed with nothing but a flashlight and my courage, I quietly climbed the creaky staircase leading to the attic. The old wooden door groaned in protest as I pushed it open, revealing a space cloaked in darkness and thick with dust. The air was cold, and a strange, musty smell lingered. After that night, things started to change in my house. It was quieter, and the heavy, eerie feeling that used to hang in the air was gone. I was finally able to sleep through the night without waking up at 3 a.m. It felt like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders. But I couldn't stop thinking about the woman in the mirror and what had happened. One afternoon, I decided to do some research about the house. It was old and had been in my family for generations, but I didn't know much about its history. I went to the local library and dug through old newspapers and records. What I found was surprising. Apparently, many years ago, there had been a woman named Elizabeth who lived in the house. She was part of a wealthy family but had mysteriously disappeared one night, and no one ever found her. Some people believed she had run away, while others thought something more sinister had happened. Her disappearance had never been solved. I was certain that the woman in the mirror was Elizabeth. She had been trapped in that strange, decayed version of the house, trying to get help. I felt a chill run through me as I realized that she had been reaching out to me specifically, maybe because I was the current owner of the house. As the days went by, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to the story. One night, I had a dream about Elizabeth. 
In the dream, she thanked me for helping her but also warned me that there was still something hidden in the house that needed to be found. When I woke up, I decided to search the attic again. There had to be something I missed. This time, I went during the day when it wasn't as scary. The attic was just as dusty and cluttered as before. I moved things around, looking for any clues. Then I noticed something odd. One of the floorboards near where the mirror had been seemed loose. I pried it up and found a small, dusty box hidden underneath. Inside the box were old letters and a diary. The letters were from Elizabeth to a man named Thomas, who I assumed was her lover. The diary detailed her life and the events leading up to her disappearance. Reading through her words, I discovered that Elizabeth had been in love with Thomas, but her family disapproved of their relationship. They had planned to run away together, but something had gone wrong. Elizabeth wrote about how she felt trapped in the house and how she believed her family had done something to keep her from leaving. As I read the last entry in her diary, I felt a connection to Elizabeth. She had been desperate to escape, just like she had shown me in the mirror. But what really caught my attention was a final note tucked in the back of the diary. It was a map of the house with an X marked in the basement. Determined to find out more, I headed to the basement. It was cold and dark, and I could hear the faint sound of dripping water. The map led me to a spot in the corner where the wall seemed slightly different. I pushed against the wall, and to my surprise, a hidden door opened. Behind the door was a small room, and inside it was a skeleton wearing old, tattered clothes. Next to the skeleton was a locket with a picture of Elizabeth and Thomas inside. It was clear that this was Elizabeth's final resting place. Her family must have trapped her here to keep her from leaving with Thomas. I felt a deep sadness for Elizabeth and a sense of anger at what had been done to her. I decided to give her a proper burial. I called the authorities, and they helped me move her remains to a cemetery where she could finally rest in peace. After Elizabeth was laid to rest, I felt a sense of closure. The house was no longer haunted by her presence, and the eerie feeling was completely gone. I knew I had done the right thing by helping her and uncovering the truth. In the end, I learned that sometimes the past can reach out to the present, seeking justice and closure. Elizabeth's story was finally known, and she could rest knowing that her secret was uncovered. My life returned to normal but I would never forget the woman in the mirror and the mystery that brought me to her. The rain drummed relentlessly against my window. Alone in my small house, the TV flickered, casting shifting shadows across the room. Outside, the storm raged, the wind was howling. I'm Sarah, a woman who lives alone in a cozy cottage at the edge of town, surrounded by dense forests. I'm not particularly brave or adventurous, but children have always held a special place in my heart. Maybe it's because I never had any of my own, or maybe it's just who I am. After some time I heard the distant cry of a child pierced through the storm, I couldn't ignore it. Maternal instinct or simple curiosity, I don't know, but I knew I had to investigate. Slipping into my coat and grabbing my umbrella, a sense of foreboding washed over me. Pushing aside my fear, I stepped out into the night. Little did I know, that decision would lead me down a path I could never have imagined. I grabbed my coat and umbrella and stepped outside. The rain was cold and heavy, but I could still hear the crying. It was coming from the forest behind my house. I live alone, and there are no other houses nearby, so I knew something was wrong. I couldn't just ignore it. I started walking towards the forest, my shoes squishing in the mud. The trees were tall and dark, and the wind was making them creak and groan. As I got closer, the crying grew louder. It sounded like a little boy, and he sounded really scared. Hello? I called out. Are you okay? There was no answer, just more crying. I kept walking, feeling uneasy. The forest was getting thicker and the path was hard to see. The crying was leading me deeper and deeper into the woods. I thought about turning back, 
but I couldn't leave a child out here alone. Where are you? I shouted. I'm here to help. Still no answer. Just crying. I pushed through some bushes and nearly slipped on the wet leaves. My heart was racing. I wasn't sure if it was because of the storm or because something felt really wrong. Finally, I saw a small figure up ahead. It was a boy, maybe six or seven years old, sitting on the ground with his back to me. He was soaked from the rain and shivering. His cries were softer now, but he still sounded scared. Hey, it's okay, I said, stepping closer. I'm here to help. What's your name? He didn't answer. He just kept crying. I reached out to touch his shoulder, but before I could, he turned around. His face was pale and his eyes were wide with fear. But there was something strange about his eyes. They didn't look right. They looked empty. Are you lost? I asked, trying to stay calm. He nodded slowly but didn't say anything. I knelt down beside him, trying to get him to stand up. Let's get you out of here, okay? It's too dangerous to stay in the forest. He stood up but didn't let go of my hand. His grip was cold and clammy. We started walking back the way I came, but the forest seemed different. The path I had taken was gone, and the trees looked unfamiliar. The boy didn't say anything, just kept holding my hand and walking silently. After what felt like hours, I saw light through the trees. It was my house. I felt a huge relief. We're almost there, I said, squeezing the boy's hand. But when I looked down, he was gone. I was holding nothing but air. I spun around, looking for him, but there was no sign of the boy. Just the dark, empty forest. I hurried back to my house, my mind racing. Who was that boy? Where did he go? I never saw him again. But sometimes, on stormy nights, I still hear the sound of a child crying in the forest. And I wonder if he's still out there, lost and alone, waiting for someone to find him. I couldn't shake off the feeling of unease after that night. I kept thinking about the boy with the empty eyes. Who was he? What was he? The days went by, and I tried to put it out of my mind, but every time it rained, I found myself listening for the sound of crying. One evening, a week after the strange encounter, I decided to go back into the forest. It was foolish, I knew, but I needed answers. I waited until it started raining again, hoping the boy would appear. Armed with a flashlight and wearing my raincoat, I stepped out into the night. The forest was just as dark and eerie as before. The rain was lighter this time, but it still made everything slippery and difficult to see. I walked the same path, hoping to find some clue about what had happened. Hello? I called out again. Is anyone there? I felt silly talking to the trees, but I had to try. The forest was silent except for the sound of the rain and my footsteps. I kept walking deeper and deeper until I found the spot where I had seen the boy. I stood there for a moment, unsure of what to do next. Then I heard it the soft, sad crying. My heart skipped a beat. It was coming from deeper in the woods, further than I had gone before. I followed the sound, pushing through the dense trees. The crying grew louder, more desperate. I felt that same uneasy feeling from before. Something wasn't right. Finally, I saw a small clearing up ahead. In the middle of it stood an old, crumbling house. It looked abandoned, the windows broken and the door hanging off its hinges. The crying was coming from inside. I approached the house cautiously. Hello? Are you in there? I called out. The crying stopped suddenly. The silence was even more unsettling. I stepped onto the creaky porch and pushed the door open. The inside was dark and smelled of damp wood. My flashlight beam cut through the darkness revealing broken furniture and debris scattered on the floor. Hello? I called again, stepping inside. My voice echoed through the empty rooms. I walked through the house, checking each room. There was no sign of the boy. Just empty, dark spaces. 
I reached the last room at the end of the hall. The door was slightly ajar, and the crying started again, louder and more desperate than before. I pushed the door open and shone my flashlight inside. The room was empty, but the crying was deafening now. I stepped inside, looking around. Suddenly, the door slammed shut behind me. I spun around, but there was no one there. My flashlight flickered and then went out, plunging me into darkness. Panic set in. I fumbled for the door handle, but it wouldn't budge. The crying was all around me now, echoing off the walls. I felt a cold hand touch my shoulder, and I screamed, banging on the door with all my strength. Then, everything went silent. The crying stopped, and the door creaked open. I stumbled out into the hallway, gasping for breath. I ran out of the house, not stopping until I was back in my own home, locking the door behind me. I never went back into that forest again. I still don't know what I encountered that night, but I know it wasn't a normal child. Whatever it was, it wanted to be found, and I had played right into its hands. Now every time it rains, I make sure to stay inside and I ignore the sounds of crying that drift from the forest. The rain hammered against the windows, a steady rhythm that filled the old house with a sense of foreboding. Alone in the dimly lit rooms, I sought refuge from the storm, the creaky floorboards echoing with each step I took. My name is Jack, an ordinary guy with a penchant for exploring old houses and uncovering their secrets. Little did I know, this particular adventure would lead me to a discovery beyond anything I could have imagined. I was alone in the old house, seeking refuge from the storm. Suddenly, I heard a steady drip coming from above. Looking up, I noticed a leak in the ceiling, water seeping through and forming a small puddle on the floor. Curiosity got the best of me as I fetched a bucket to catch the water. Standing on a wobbly chair, I reached up to investigate the source of the leak. To my surprise, my fingers brushed against something solid hidden within the darkness of the attic. With a tug, I pulled away a piece of the ceiling, revealing a small entrance. Dust motes danced in the dim light as I cautiously climbed into the attic, my heart pounding in my chest. The air was musty, filled with the scent of age and neglect. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I saw rows of forgotten relics lining the walls, old furniture decaying boxes, and tattered paintings. Amongst the clutter, I found a stack of aged photographs, their edges curling with time. Each one whispered tales of bygone days, capturing moments of joy and sorrow frozen in time. I lingered over them, imagining the lives of the people captured within their frames. Further exploration led me to a pile of weathered letters, their ink faded with age. With trembling hands, I opened one and began to read. It spoke of love lost and secrets buried, hinting at a past shrouded in mystery. As I delved deeper into the attic secrets, the intensity of the rain outside crescendoed, the sound becoming deafening. Suddenly, a chilling click echoed through the room, sending a shiver down my spine. I turned to see the door to the attic ceiling shut behind me, trapping me inside. Panic surged within me as I realized I was trapped in this hidden chamber, cut off from the outside world. I strained to discern the approaching footsteps, the weight of impending revelation pressing upon me. Who or what lurked in the darkness beyond? My mind raced with fear and uncertainty as I searched for a way out. But with each passing moment, the realization sank in that I was not alone in the attic. Someone, or something, was watching waiting in the shadows. With no ghostly apparitions or ominous figures, the true horror lay in the unknown, the fear of what lurked just out of sight. And as the storm raged on outside, I could only pray that I would make it out of the attic alive, my heart pounding with each suspenseful moment. As I frantically searched for an escape route, my hands brushed against something cold and metallic hidden beneath a pile of old blankets. Pulling it out, I discovered an ancient key, tarnished with age but still sturdy. With trembling fingers, I inserted the key into the lock of the sealed door, hoping against hope that it would offer me a way out. Miraculously, the key turned, 
and with a creak of rusted hinges, the door swung open, revealing a narrow staircase leading down into darkness. Relief flooded through me as I descended the stairs, each step bringing me closer to freedom. But as I reached the bottom, my heart sank at what I found, a second door, identical to the one I had just escaped from, blocking my path. Panic clawed at my chest as I realized I was trapped in an endless loop, doomed to wander the confines of the attic for all eternity. The chilling click I had heard earlier echoed in my mind, a cruel reminder of my fate. Desperation gave way to resignation as I sank to the ground, my hope dwindling with each passing moment. And as the storm raged on outside, I knew that I would never escape the clutches of the attic, my fate sealed within its hidden chambers forevermore. With resignation settling in, I sat there in the dimness, the sound of raindrops against the attic windows serving as a relentless reminder of my entrapment. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, of unseen eyes following my every move in the shadows. Time seemed to blur as I sat there, lost in my thoughts. But then, amidst the oppressive silence, I heard a faint scratching sound coming from the corner of the attic. My heart skipped a beat as I turned towards the source of the noise. In the dim light, I could just make out the silhouette of something moving, a small figure, hunched and shrouded in darkness. With a surge of adrenaline, I stumbled to my feet, my instincts screaming at me to flee. But as I backed away, the figure emerged from the shadows, revealing itself to be a small, emaciated creature with sunken eyes and tattered clothes. Its gaze bore into mine with a mixture of curiosity and desperation, as if pleading for help. Fear mingled with pity as I stared at the creature before me. It was unlike anything I had ever seen, a remnant of a bygone era trapped in this forgotten attic. And as it reached out a trembling hand towards me, I knew that I couldn't leave it behind. With trembling hands, I extended a hand towards the creature, offering it a lifeline amidst the darkness. And as our fingers touched, a surge of energy passed between us, a connection forged in the depths of the attic secrets. In that moment, the air seemed to shift, the oppressive atmosphere lifting as a sense of peace washed over me. And as I looked into the creature's eyes, I saw a glimmer of gratitude, a silent acknowledgement of the bond we had formed. Together, we faced the darkness of the attic, no longer alone in our struggle. And as the storm continued to rage outside, I knew that we would find a way to escape, united in our determination to break free from the confines of this haunted chamber. I was cleaning up the attic because it was a mess. Mom said we needed to clear out some stuff or we wouldn't have space for anything else. So, there I was, surrounded by old junk and dust. I didn't really like being up there. It always felt spooky with all the shadows and creaky noises. But I figured I'd better do it before Mom started nagging again. Plus, who knows, maybe I'd find something cool hidden away up there. As I was cleaning up the attic, trying to find some old stuff to sell or throw away, my hand bumped into something hard. It felt like a box. I pulled it out from the pile of junk and dust and saw that it was an old diary. The cover was all worn out and the pages were yellowish, like it had been there for ages. Curious, I opened it up and started reading. The first few pages were just boring stuff about someone's daily life, but as I flipped through, things started to get weird. There were tales of strange sounds in the night, objects moving on their own and even sightings of weird figures lurking in the shadows. But what really caught my attention was the repeated mention of a mysterious box. The writer seemed terrified of it, warning whoever found the diary to stay away from it at all costs. They said it was cursed or something, and anyone who opened it would suffer dire consequences. I couldn't help but feel a chill creeping up my spine as I read on. The writer seemed convinced that something terrible was going to happen, something that involved me. Me. I couldn't believe it. Was this some kind of prank? But as I reached the final entry, all doubts vanished. The writer spoke directly to me, warning me to stay away from the box, to leave it alone and forget about it. They said it was too late for them, but there was still hope for me. I closed the diary, 
my heart pounding in my chest. What should I do? Should I listen to the warning and stay away from the box? Or should I investigate further, try to uncover the truth behind the mystery? I knew one thing for sure, whatever was in that box, it couldn't be good. But the temptation was too strong. I had to know. So, with a mixture of fear and determination, I made my way back to the attic, the diary clutched tightly in my hand. The box was still there, sitting innocently among the other forgotten treasures. Taking a deep breath, I reached out and opened it. And in that moment, I knew I had made a terrible mistake. Inside the box, there was nothing but darkness. It seemed to swallow up the feeble light that filtered in from the small attic window. I hesitated, my hand hovering over the void, a sense of dread creeping over me. But curiosity got the better of me, and slowly, I reached deeper into the darkness. My fingers brushed against something cold and metallic. I recoiled, but then curiosity pushed me forward again, urging me to explore further. As I delved deeper into the box, my fingers closed around an object. I pulled it out and held it up to the light. It was a small, ornate key, intricately carved with strange symbols and runes. My heart raced as I realized what I had found. This key must unlock something important, something connected to the strange occurrences detailed in the diary. But what could it be? I glanced back at the diary, its pages filled with warnings and cryptic messages. Could this key hold the answers to the mystery? Or would it unlock something even more sinister? With trembling hands, I pocketed the key and made my way out of the attic. I needed to do some research, find out more about the history of the house and the box hidden in the attic. But as I descended the stairs, a feeling of unease settled over me. It felt like I was being watched, like there was something lurking in the shadows, waiting for me to make a mistake. I brushed it off as nerves and continued on my way determined to uncover the truth behind the mystery of the box and the diary. Little did I know, the true horror was only just beginning. 